Hi everybody, this is Ian Hazikosis with the World of Warcraft team. And I just wanted to join all of you and give you an update on what's coming up over the course of the next couple of months in WoW. First up, Rise of Ashara is coming to live servers on June 25th, just around the corner. I have to thank all of you for your patience. Uh, this has been, you know, I know it's been eagerly anticipated, and this has been a labor of love for the World of Warcraft team as a whole. It's one of the biggest content updates we've ever released, and we've been hard at work listening to feedback, polishing, iterating, fixing bugs, and trying to make it the best experience we can because that's what all of you deserve. Now, speaking of bugs, I have to thank all of you who have gotten on the public test realm in the last couple of months. I was actually just talking to one of our QA leads who was telling me that they reviewed over 20,000 bug reports submitted by players on the PTR, and that out of that, they actually identified and tracked over 1,000 new bugs that we weren't previously aware of. The team as a whole has been hard at work fixing those, and hopefully it's going to make for a more polished, smooth experience for everybody. Now let's talk about what exactly is in store when we jump into Rise of Ashara. So when you first log in on June 25th or you know, 26th or 27th, if you're in Europe or Asia, depending on your faction, you're going to receive an urgent summons from your faction leader. Now, on the Horde side, the Thanos and Sylvanas have received some interesting instructions, some interesting information from this talking sentient dagger that, you know, seems really trustworthy. And so, of course, they're following it out into open waters. And members of the Alliance, uh, Matthias Shaw and others, have, uh, have discovered this hidden plan. And they're, of course, tailing the Horde, hoping to ambush the flagship of the Horde fleet and deal a final crippling blow after the events of Battle of Dazar Lore. But little do both of them know that they're actually sailing directly into a trap that's been laid by none other than Queen Ashara, one of Azeroth's most powerful and fearsome villains. Someone who's been, you know, kind of pulling the strings behind actions that we have seen for multiple expansions now. She is finally coming into the fore. She's finally making our move. And we are being plunged right into the heart of her trap. So as we struggle to make a foothold, to fight for survival, in the newly exposed land of Nashtatar, we'll begin to establish a base, make some new allies, and begin to discover what's going on in Nashtatar and how we can stop it. Alongside that, we're also going to receive word from our good friend Magni Bronzebeard, who, along with Mother, the construct from Muldir, has been analyzing what's going on with Azeroth, what's going on with Azerite, and they have an exciting piece of information to share. They have detected this energy coalescing in different places around the world. It's, a, it's ancient Titan energy, these Titan essences that were once part of the energy designed to safeguard Azeroth, left there by the Titans eons ago. And with her Heart of Azeroth, we can now go out and harness this energy and infuse it into her Heart of Azeroth to unlock all new power, to unlock the true potential of the Heart. The way this takes form in actual game terms is it's an all-new system where you will have multiple slots in your Heart of Azeroth. As you level it up, you'll be able to earn these essences from varied sources, from varied types of content, and socket them into your Heart of Azeroth and choose which one, and eventually which ones, as you earn more, you want to activate. They'll give you a single active major ability, depending on which one you have in the central slot, as well as additional passives that can complement each other. And really, it's a way to mix and match and customize the Heart of Azeroth to suit your playstyle. And this all-new system coming in Rise of Ashara actually complements the existing Azerite armor powers that will remain on your helm and on your shoulders and on your chest. However, the artifact level requirements to access those powers will no longer be increasing. So in Rise of Ashara and beyond, whenever you get a new helm, whenever you get new shoulders, it's just a chance to dial in the exact powers that you want, including some new ones that we're adding in Rise of Ashara, without any need to actually continue to level your heart to earn those. It just makes those pieces of gear more exciting without the feeling of needing to re-grind something you've already earned. The final major piece of content in Rise of Ashara is also the island of Mechagon, where once you've gotten your essences, once you've set up your base in Nashatar, you're also going to catch wind of a discovery by the goblins and by the gnomes, the ancient land of Mechagon. This paradise rumored to contain ancient titan secrets and some of the most advanced technology that Azeroth has ever known. And when we go there, we're going to find instead something a bit different from this utopia that may have been imagined. It's more of a junker wasteland where the Rustbolt resistance, this scrappy group of junker gnomes, is 
trying to eke out an existence in the shadow of the tyranny of King Mechagon, leader of the Mechanomes, who you know, sees a future path to ascendance in replacing all the weak, fleshy bits that we have with strong, powerful, resilient machinery. But as it turns out, we actually are kind of attached to our fleshy bits, and so we're going to need to join the Junker Resistance and Rust Bolt Resistance and fight against King Mechagon, eventually leading us into a mega dungeon that awaits in there. So all of that content, Nashtatar, Mechagon, the Essence system, as well as the Outdoor World systems, quests, rewards, follower friends that you'll be able to meet and level up in Nashtatar, and so much more are all available right when Rise of Ashara releases. By doing that content, you'll be able to earn reputation with your new Nashtatar allies, as well as the Rust Bolt Resistance, which will set you on your way to unlocking the second part of the Battle for Azeroth Pathfinder achievement. Which will, which will let you soar above the skies of not just Kul Tiras and Zandalar, but also the new lands of Nashtatar and Mechagon. And I think we're thinking that for people who are playing actively, that's something that you should be able to earn within a few weeks of gameplay, and then you'll be able to enjoy flight once you've earned it from here on out in Battle for Azeroth. Now, that's the outdoor content that I've talked about. So, however, our major instances, our Eternal Palace Raid, the Operation Mechagon Mega Dungeon, those are going to remain closed for the first couple of weeks until Season 3 of Battle for Azeroth formally kicks off. We want to give everybody a chance to get back into the swing of things, to get caught up if they need to get geared up, to get their bearings, get a sense of the story, get a sense of their new surroundings, and then you'll be able to enter these instances to take on the mightiest foes that oppose you. Now, in the meantime, we're setting up a little bit of a post-season period for Battle for Azeroth Season 2. If you want to do Mythic Plus Dungeons, those are still there, and they'll continue to give all the same rewards that they have been. Similarly, you can queue for rated PvP and continue to earn Conquest, continue to earn all the rewards based on your rating that you have been throughout Season 2. The only things that are going away, however, are any end-of-season achievements, titles, feats of strength. We want to make sure that for those purposes, we are ending the competitive season when Rise of Ashara goes live. Because with changes to class balance, with the introduction of new essences and new items, we didn't want to throw a wrench and destabilize a months-long season in just its last couple of weeks. On the raid side, however, since Jaina and Unot aren't necessarily going to go to the forums and complain about the unfairness of it all, we are still allowing guilds to continue to earn ahead of the curve and cutting edge for those two weeks. So if your guild is close to finishing out the raids of Tides of Vengeance, you'll have the Heart of Azeroth Essences, as well as Benthic gear and some new exciting items from the outdoor content, maybe help give you that one last push you need to make it across the finish line. But then after those two weeks, so in the week of July 9th, that's when Season 3 formally begins. Ashara's Eternal Palace Raid will open up on normal and heroic difficulty. The new Mythic Keystone season will begin with a new Beguiling Affix to take the place of Reaping that we've known in Season 2. And of course, PvP Season 3 begins with all new rewards to work for and more powerful gear all around. In fact, in general, across the world, the item level ceiling is going to go up from 425 to 455 at that time in order to make room for the new, more powerful gear coming out of Ashara's Eternal Palace and the parallel reward tracks in Mythic Plus and PvP. And then one week after that, we will have our Mythic Raid difficulty opening, as well as the first Raid Finder wing in Eternal Palace. And I look forward to seeing some of the best guilds around the world dive in there and see who's going to come out on top and who'll be the first one to defeat Queen Ashara and learn the secrets that she guards. So to say the least, it's going to be a very exciting month ahead in Azeroth and everywhere within. And we couldn't be more excited. You know, this, this effort, this content update has really been a labor of love for the entire World of Warcraft team. And we can't wait to see all of you in it. We can't wait to see you in Nashatar and Mechagon and everywhere else. While I'm here, I also wanted to take a few moments to address some broad areas of discussion and feedback that we've seen throughout the community and maybe share some new information, but also try to shed some light on the philosophies and underlying reasons for why we approach things the way we do. So the first main area that we always see discussed, and especially with regard to Rise of Ashara, is rewards and our philosophy around rewards. I think two questions that come up commonly are why, what makes us choose to update the rewards that come from some types of content but then not others? And then second, 
again, what, what guides us when trying to determine where we have catch-up mechanics in place and have catch-up mechanics gone too far? Do they undermine the value of accomplishment and the value of rewards? So I just want to dive into our discussion of rewards a little bit and try to address both of those questions. So first off, when it comes to you know, updating versus keeping rewards static, a lot of that is driven by the type of content that we're talking about. So on the far end of the spectrum, we of course have PvP, where the content is by definition, you know, it, you're queuing into the same arenas, you're queuing into battlegrounds, but you're fighting players whose own skills and whose own power is evolving, and that just is the system that it is, and its rewards keep pace with the rest of the content where we're introducing new raids and dungeons. That's how World of Warcraft has been forever. The other end of the spectrum, we have raids. As new raid tiers come out, they offer a greater challenge, offer greater rewards. When it comes to areas in the middle, though, the thing that guides us primarily is trying to, is sort of what's the best way for everyone to make use of the content that's out there that we have available? What's going to be the most enjoyable and satisfying approach to that content? You know, with something like the Mythic Keystone system, that was added to shore up and to address a problem that we'd seen in Warlords or Draenor and Prior, where we had all these cool dungeons. The players had a ton of fun in for the first month or so of an expansion, but then they felt like they very quickly lost relevance after that. And so with some added variety, with the week-to-week -week variation of affixes, with the introduction of new seasonal affixes, and hand tweaks to bosses and certain aspects of the dungeons to keep the experience fresh, Mythic Plus continues to offer progressively better rewards as the dungeons evolve over the course of an expansion. When it comes to things like world bosses in the outdoor world, though, ultimately, there's something about an RPG where it's important to be able to advance beyond challenges, overcome those challenges, and leave them behind. Whereas Mythic Plus is a scaling system, world bosses in the outdoor world are static content, as are warfronts. And the world bosses that you once fought in Kul Tiras, you're now stronger than they are in many ways, and you don't need the rewards anymore. But there are all new, more powerful bosses waiting for you in the outdoor areas of Nashatar and Mechagon. Similarly, on the Warfront side, we have all new heroic Warfronts coming in Rise of Ashara that will offer a sterner test and give greater rewards. I mean, in, and part of this also depends on the philosophy and the approach of the content update in particular. So Tides of Vengeance, came out just a few months after Battle for Azeroth was first released, and a lot of players were still really sinking their teeth into Kul Tiras and Zandalar and the outdoor content there. And so when we added features like assaults or some additional emissary rewards, we were overlaying them on top of the content that was already being engaged in. We weren't trying to replace Kul Tiras and Zandalar. Whereas in Rise of Ashara, we're adding two new zones, and we fully expect that the reward structure should you know, kind of be parallel to the player behavior of shifting focus from Kul Tiras and Zandalar to Nashtatar and Mechagon. Just as we saw in Legion, over time, players spent more and more of their time in Broken Shore and then eventually in Argus towards the end of the expansion, and the reward structure accommodated that. So, to sum up, we want to strike a balance between, you know, keeping content relevant, where there is a desire on the part of players to keep doing that content, like PvP or dungeons, but then also making sure that we're not artificially extending the lifetime, lifetime of content with rewards after the time that players have largely you know, gotten tired of it and want to move on. And so when it comes to the outdoor world, at this point, you've spent quite a number of months doing the content in Kul'Tiras and Zandalar. Let's leave assaults behind. Let's leave those world bosses behind and seek out greater challenges and greater rewards in Nashtatar and Mechagon. Now, for the second major area of the rewards discussion, it catch-up gear. Now, this is something that the World of Warcraft team has grappled with since the very earliest days, going back to tier 0.5 dungeon sets all the way back in Classic, or badge vendors in Burning Crusade and Wrath. Now, all of these efforts and all these systems have been aimed at solving the same core problem, which is we want to make sure that someone who is joining World of Warcraft a bit late, whether they're a new player, whether they're someone who took a break and is coming back, or whether it's just someone who's switching mains or wants to play an alt more seriously, we want to make sure that they aren't marginalized, that they can actually get into and enjoy the current content where the majority of the player base is currently progressing. And so you know, we've always offered ways of 
accelerating a little bit. So that, yes, the person who spent three or four months earning some gear in Battle of Dazar lore and the recent season two will be able to do outdoor content, they'll be able to do new systems, upgrade their benthic gear, and attain that gear level significantly more quickly. Now, of course, the core concern that we see raised throughout the community is, well, doesn't that undermine the accomplishments that went into earning that gear in the first place? And this is something that, as I said, the team has grappled with because that feeling of progression, that feeling of accomplishment is so central to RPG and MMORPG mechanics as you are comparing yourself to your peers, as you're comparing yourself to your enemies, and you want to make sure that your efforts matter. But we've struck that balance in favor of making sure that when your friend comes back and wants to raid with you in Eternal Palace, your answer isn't, well, spend a few months in Oldir and Dazar Lore and then get back to me, by which time you're probably done with Eternal Palace. So at the same time, though, we want to make sure that we are offering some complementary systems where accomplishments are more enduring. You know, back in Legion, efforts that you got, efforts that you put into earning Legion legendaries, those remained best in slot throughout the entire expansion. And that was controversial at the time. People who felt like they were behind on legendaries didn't feel like they could catch up. But at the same time, there was something valuable about knowing that these pyrobracers that you got on your fire mage were going to be your best in slot for the foreseeable future. And in Rise of Ashara, in particular, we have the Essences system where there is no planned future shortcuts or catch up there. The effort that goes into unlocking and upgrading an Essence will be enduring for the remainder of Battle for Azeroth. So if you're setting your sights on a high rank Essence from Mythic Dungeons or from Rated PvP or elsewhere, you can rest assured that the effort that you put in to achieving that goal will not be diminished by anything that comes on later in the expansion. We may introduce other essences that offer different options for you to mix and match, but not a faster or easier way of getting a particular essence that you have your sights set on today. And then on the item front, just to kind of wrap this up, um, it's also important to remember that you are enjoying the short-term advantage from whatever you've earned. Another topic where we've seen a ton of discussion in the community recently has been around what sorts of gear find their way into PvP and what are our philosophies around that. So when it comes to PvP and World of Warcraft, I think, you know, historically, we've kind of covered a broad spectrum philosophically here. In the very original days, even in the early days of Arena, there were, you know, there was a meta that was heavily defined by gear that came from raids and other sources, whether it's that terrible warrior on your server who got a dark edge of insanity and was just destroying people in what were some gulch, or people wearing shadow resist gear into early arena matches in Burning Crusade, or warglaives, and so forth. Um, all the way to the other end of the spectrum, where I think we hit kind of a peak in Legion, where stats truly didn't matter, where when you went into PvP, you had a template assigned to you. It didn't matter if you wanted haste or crit, you were going to get what the developers gave you when you entered that environment. And on reflection, we felt like that was several steps too far away from the RPG, MMORPG roots of the genre, where stats should matter, rewards should matter, choices should matter. And your character, the avatar that you play in Azeroth, should feel ideally consistent, whether you are in a raid, whether you're in war mode, whether you're jumping into arena, rather than having large swaths of your items suddenly cease to work, or the way your abilities do or don't work change drastically out from under you. And so philosophically, you know, as we've seen some items from Crucible of Storms and other raid content become relatively prominent in Arena, that's not inherently a red flag for us. We think that it's okay if at the very high end, people looking for a competitive advantage in PvP sometimes look at items that are exclusive to dungeon or raid or other loot tables and try to seek them out to get an advantage. Because that's part of what an RPG is about. That's part of what RPG PvP is about. It's asymmetry. And similarly, you know, we don't have a problem, as we've seen a lot of discussion about the conflict and strife PvP essence that's just come out, um, and it's coming up in Rise of Ashara. It doesn't bother us if players who are looking at high-end raid strategies or pushing high-end keys in Mythic Plus look at some of those PvP talents that you could get access to through that essence and say that situationally, 
that would be the best choice for them. And do some of them feel like they should now go in and try to achieve a high PvP rating to earn the most powerful version of that essence? Maybe yes. But if you're trying to push the very high end of what's possible on a given type of content, I'm not sure there's anything wrong with feeling a little bit of pressure to go branch out and to experience the breadth of World of Warcraft and all of its systems. The progression tracks that we have laid out ensure that for the overwhelming majority of players, if you want to be competitive, if you want to achieve most of the goals that you want and set for yourself in PvP, you don't need to look outside the PvP gearing system to do that. Similarly, if you want to complete our raids or complete Mythic Keystone achievements, you can do those without needing to get gear from PvP. But if there are situational advantages to doing so, to crossing over, to experiencing all types of the game, that also serves as a reward for those players who are able to maintain a level of accomplishment and achievement in all parts of the game. And that's not something we want to sacrifice or dispense with. Now, all of that aside, that has nothing to do with the actual impact of the items themselves. So the biggest problem with many of the Crucible items was what they did to the pace of gameplay. Even if those items had been available from PvP, the problem with them wasn't that you got them from a raid. The problem was that they were overly potent and tended to stall matches and lead to excessive dampening stacks and a generally unenjoyable pace to the overall gameplay. Now that's a problem for us to solve on its own terms with adjustments to those items and how they work in PvP, but it's not about where the rewards come from. So going forward, we're still committed to making sure that the majority of exciting PvP rewards come from PvP and the majority of exciting raid rewards come from raiding, but if there is some crossover here or there, whether it's deliberate or not, we don't entirely view that as an unhealthy thing and maybe something that we even want to encourage. Because ultimately, World of Warcraft is a vibrant, interconnected world. And when players are encouraged to branch out and experience different parts of it, we think that makes the experience richer and, dare I say it, even more fun for everybody. Okay, and now it would be impossible and, in fact, irresponsible to engage in any kind of philosophical discussion around community feedback without digging into the topic of class design. Now, we've been hearing, really, for, for years now, um, since Warlords and Legion, a, a steady amount of feedback from the community about the direction of class design, and with a particular focus on the, the topic of so-called class pruning and the removal of abilities in many cases, or moving abilities from baseline to spec-specific, or moving them to other systems like PvP talents. And while at its core we do think that there was a lot of good work done there in terms of removing redundant abilities, pulling back from some homogenization that led to nearly every class and spec having multiple forms of crowd control or utility that actually hurt class uniqueness, uh, us consistent point of feedback has been the concern that we've gone too far. And after a lot of reflection and ongoing discussion, ultimately I would like to say that we agree with that feedback. Um, there are places where in Warlords and in Legion, we were probably too focused on button count as a measure of complexity, when I think there's a lot more nuance to it than that. And that led to us pulling back a, a bit farther than we probably ought to have. And so as we engage in discussions about the future of class design, as we look beyond you know, the current content update to a future expansion and even beyond, and we're asking what we want to do, where we want to take classes next, that feedback that we've heard really helps shape those discussions in a lot of ways. And so we look at some abilities that we removed that reduced overall button count, but actually probably did more harm than good in the act of taking them away. Um, one example that comes to mind for me is something like Alter Time for Mages, which was a fun, super flavorful and thematic ability that allowed for some masterfully skillful plays, also allowed for some masterfully skillful ways of getting yourself killed if you misused it. Um, a lot of players probably ignored that ability. You know, if you, did, if you looked at it, you're like, I'm not totally sure where, when and where I'd want to use this. That was fine. Many players probably didn't even have it bound. Um, and it was realizations like that that led to us removing it, but I'm not sure that mages are better or more fun or that WoW class design as a whole is better for not having altered time somewhere in the mix. Uh, now, that ability is not going to come back tomorrow, but it's the exact kind of thing that we are, we are talking about in terms of what direction we want to head in the longer term. 
Of course, there are also some, some more challenging areas of discussion where there are no quick fixes or solves. You know, we look at something like warrior stances, and certainly as we've been going back and diving into classic along with the rest of you, there is no question there was something thematic and unique about stance swapping and the way that whole system played out originally. But I think at this point, even when stances were around, they hadn't been required to use abilities for quite a long time. There's a certain point where we think it would likely be too jarring for a bunch of warriors to log in one day and discover that you actually can't pummel unless you're in the appropriate stance or that you can't charge or, you know, or hamstring or the like. But how can we offer a sense of you know, identity? How can we offer a sense of uniqueness that goes along with what that used to represent? Those are the sorts of questions that we're asking. And speaking of identity, I think we've, we've talked a lot about class identity in the foregoing years. But reflecting on those efforts, there are ways in which we've probably actually furthered spec identity at the expense of class identity in some cases. As we moved abilities from you know, class-wide to being spec-specific in a number of cases, um, we've perhaps gone a bit too far away from that core choice the players make when they're looking at character creation, looking at character select, and they decide whether they want to be a mage or a hunter or a shaman or a rogue. And then, ideally, specialization should truly be just that. It should be taking a class and picking a facet of it that excites you the most, with which you identify the most, and doubling down on that and becoming a master of that. Instead, for many classes or, or some specs, that choice entails almost turning into an all-new class with entirely different abilities and only a little bit of overlap. And that's an area where we actually would like to also pull back from. So as we think to the future, we want to find ways of reestablishing class as a foundation, whether that's taking some abilities that are now spec-specific and spreading them back out so that the entire class has access to them, even if they're kind of off-role for you, there's value in that hybridity and that utility, but also looking to all new systems that we introduce down the line and trying to anchor them at the level of class rather than spec, because, again, class identity means class identity, not spec identity. And really with regard to that, I, I, we want to underscore the importance of class identity and class design to World of Warcraft. I think a point that players have made on many occasions is that to many, you know, the way your class plays and feels is essential. It's one of the most important things in World of Warcraft, period. Your class is the lens through which you view the world. It's how you interact with the world. It's how you engage with all of your enemies and your allies. And if you're playing a class that you don't feel is satisfying, a class whose fantasy doesn't resonate with you, that's absolutely going to hinder your enjoyment of all the rest of the world. And so it truly is a top priority for us. And I want to thank everyone, and continue to thank you, for your ongoing feedback. And yes, your criticism where appropriate. I think it's helped us to sharpen and focus our discussions around this topic. And you know, it really is a, a powerful guide to us as we look to the future of World of Warcraft and class design in particular. And last but certainly not least, we can't talk about what's ahead for WoW this summer without talking about WoW Classic. Now, it's been an honor and it's been incredibly exciting for the entire team to see everyone's passion around this as tens of thousands of folks have jumped into our closed beta to help give us feedback, report bugs, point out inconsistencies, and hundreds of thousands of players have helped us with our stress tests, all in the lead up to launching Classic on August 27th. Now, we've had a couple of big stress tests as you've broken our servers. We think we've you know, done some work to make sure they're going to hold up, but we'll see for sure just around the corner on June 19th where we're going to have another stress test, our biggest yet, as we try to simulate what that day one rush is going to be like and get our servers to a place where they're going to hold up for everybody in just a couple months. So all in all, really, this is going to be an incredible summer for World of Warcraft. We have just around the corner on June 25th, Rise of Ashara dropping, and then two months after that, WoW Classic on August 27th. So I hope to see all of you in Azeroth. I can't wait, whether it's Azeroth now or Azeroth back then. Thank you.